All right. So welcome back. As I promised, today I'll start with some plans for our midterm exam, which will happen on Friday. So here's the detailed plan. I posted an announcement on Brewing Learn, so you can read it more carefully later on. But in short, uh, what's in this announcement is first talking about like when and like what our midterm exam is going to cover. So the midterm exam will cover everything from lecture one all the way until the end of today. Right, so today we'll finish up our um, discussion on calculation of entropy changes, which is section 3.4. Right, so everything covered from lecture one to today are fair game for your midterm exam. And then we have when and where. So um, this room should be big enough, but I also requested like a separate room so that people can sit like away from each other. It's open book, open notes, so people need more space to access their lecture notes. Um, so check with your UID number and also your uh, lecture section. So in this lecture, we are the 9 a.m. Uh, or lecture one. So if your UID is an even number, it's going to be in this room. If it is going to be, uh, if your UID ends in odd number, uh, you'll have your exam in dot hall. Um, now, your TA or me will be there to, to administrative the exam with you. Uh, what do you expect in the exam? So your exam is like what we said in the course syllabus. It's open book, open note. So you can use any uh, lecture notes you like or any like textbook you like or your discussion worksheets. The only thing that's not allowed are any electronic devices. So unfortunately, if you have your lecture note on an iPad, you want to print it out on paper. So we do not allow any electronic um, devices during the exam. What's that? Okay, structure of the midterm exam. So the structure of your midterm exam is three different parts. The first kind of question is true and false problem or multiple choice problem. So the take home message for the first section is say, this is just like putting the answer. You don't have to explain anything. Just tell me what you think. True and false, multiple choice. All right, so 10 of the, these kind of problems, each worth five points. That takes 50 points. You don't have to give us any explanation. Uh, section two are five short answer problems. So when say short answer, it means you shouldn't spend more than like three minutes on each of the questions. It's going to be a very straightforward one line question um, answer to the question. We'll also give you, I might give you like a larger space to answer the problem. That's just like for, for like page saving. So you shouldn't take like more than three minutes for any of the short answer problems. And then section three will be a comprehensive problem. So that's going to be a problem with multiple parts. So maybe you have like a, a B, and C. So ideally, it should be A, B, and C directing you to the final answer. So that's the structure of the midterm exam. And then also some study suggest suggestions. For example, your chapter end problem, your discussion worksheet, example problem we did in class will be a um, good source to review what's going to be in your midterm exam. So for our Wednesday lecture, we call it a buffer lecture. So that's going to be a problem solving together and also review on every topic we discussed. So I, went, I posted a uh, short so survey called midterm one buffer survey. So basically, it's listing um, the topics we discussed so far. And please pick up to three topics that you want me to go into more detail on our Wednesday lecture just to prepare you for the midterm exam. And then I also suggest like you create your own like one page uh, formula sheet. It doesn't need to be one page. I mean, we don't have limitation on how many lecture notes you want to use. But the most challenging thing I find for any open book exams is don't try to learn the material during the exam. Right? You want to already know the material before you walk in to the exam room. And that's going to be more helpful for you to prepare your own equation sheet and know where to find what equation. And then uh, let's see, we also off offer like partial credit in our grading. So keep in mind, it is more important to set up the calculation than to plug in number and get the final answer correct. All right, so if setup problem is counting like 70% of your grade, plug in number and get a final numeric answer is like 30% of your grade. So just keep in mind, pay more attention to like how to set up the problem correctly. 
and uh, very little. At the end, we have administrative notes. Um, first thing, we do not have a discussion worksheet due this weekend since we only have like one lecture, right? So it doesn't make any sense. So uh, your TA, Alex, will be with you on Tuesday and Thursday sessions due just for like review the materials, do a Q&A, and also answer questions you might have for the midterm exam. You will have a discussion worksheet next week though. Um, and also I posted my previous uh, midterm exam just for, your, for you to practice. But keep in mind the structure of my previous midterm is a little bit less than ideal. It's longer, way longer than I hoped it to be. So um, use it as a, as a source for practice, but don't take it too literal. Don't be frightened to say like, hey, this is gonna be as long like this time. Hopefully this time I'll make it more reasonable. All right, um, any questions before we, yes? Um, you can find the walkthrough. I don't have an answer key. I, I have a walkthrough for my last midterm exam oh. in my YouTube channel. So you can just click into 24-4 uh, or something. So there's a, a walkthrough on the previous midterm exam. Any other questions? No? Okay. And again, I'll be hosting my office hour tomorrow. So hopefully I'll have people stopping by. And for today's lecture, let's just finishing up on our section 3.4. So a quick review on what we discussed, right? So in our last Friday's lecture, we went over definition of entropy. Remember, we spent half of our lecture talking about um, like on top of Carnot's cycle, which we find that by doing the cyclic integral over the Carnot cycle, we have a function like dq over t that goes to zero for that cyclic integral, hinting that dq over t is a state function. Now, at the beginning of our last lecture, we spent some time talking about the relationship between Carnot cycle and any reversible cycle. Our conclusion is that um, this state function, the dq reversible over t, is a generally true um, state function for any reversible cycle, not only for Carnot cycle. And hence, we defined our new state function called entropy. So by definition, the derivation of, or the, uh, the ds, the derivation of entropy, ds equals to dq reversible over temperature. And then we went over calculations of entropy changes. So in general, since the definition of entropy, or ds, equals to dq reversible over t, when calculating entropy, it's a little bit different than what we discussed for enthalpy and internal energy. So for entropy, we always want to be able to somehow build a reversible path linking between your initial and final state. Or more directly, we set up our three different steps in calculating the change of entropy. First step, identify the initial and final state, one and two. If it is reversible, then we're ready to calculate our delta S um, by, using the, by calculating heat change or heat transfer. If it is irreversible, then we need to somehow build a reversible path linking between your initial state and final state and then calculate the change of entropy. All right, and the calculation here is basically taking the integral of ds, which gives you delta s between your initial and final state. So in our last lecture, we went over several pretty straightforward reversible processes, including like any cyclic process, that doesn't matter if it's reversible or not, for any cyclic process, your delta s will equal to zero. For reversible adiabatic processes, um, we have delta S equals to zero because adiabatic processes, you have Q equals to zero, and hence my Q reversible equals to zero. Later on, we also talk about reversible phase change at constant temperature and pressure. We have reversible isothermal processes, um, isobaric heating without uh, phase change, and then we have ended at discussion of reversible change of state of a perfect gas. All right, so in here, uh, let's just pick up from where we left and talking about what is delta S for this reversible change of state of a perfect gas, like a general expression. So 
on the on my lecture note, I'm just gonna quickly write with you like what exactly are each of the term mean, just to refresh your memory. So first one, we have reversible. So a reversible process tells us we can use relationship like the S equals to Q reversible over T. Or the other way to put it is you can write um, QREV equals to TDS. At the same time, for reversible processes, we know the work reversible equals to negative PDB. All right. And then the change of state. So in here, the change of state, the state refers to a thermodynamic state. So remember in our lecture one, we discussed that a thermodynamic state tells us like, hey, we specify our macroscopic thermodynamic properties like pressure, volume, and temperature. So a change of state is referring to change of my macroscopic properties like pressure, temperature, and volume. All right. And at the end, we have our perfect gas. So whenever we refer to perfect gas, well, we have PV equals to an RT. And then for perfect gas, we have our DU equals to CV dt, DH equals to CP dt. And on top of everything that's stated in here, we also have our first law of thermodynamics, which is du equals to dw plus dq, or you can also write it as delta u equals to w plus q. And now in here, we'll do a quick derivation to get a general expression for delta S or the change of entropy of any reversible um, change of state of a perfect gas. So I'm gonna do that on the board with everything labeled here. So what do we have? We have dS equals to Q over T. What we're looking for is delta S. So naturally, my delta S equals to the integral between 1 to 2 dq reversible over t. So by looking at the definition of my delta S, we know that we want to have an expression of dq over um, dq reversible. So in the list of things we have, obviously, the only thing connected to calculating heat is our first law of thermodynamics. So we have first law, which is, well, du equals to dq reversible plus dw reversible for this process. Or my dq reversible equals to du minus dw reversible. <coughs> And now in here, we're ready to use what we know that's in the setup, right? So for example, my du for ideal gas equals to CV dt. Now the CV may or may not be a constant. It might also be a function of temperature, but I'm just gonna write like CV dt for now. And then the negative dw reversible equals to PDB. And then for ideal gas, that's an RT over V. D. Or taking that together, we got EQ reversible equals to CV DT plus an RT over V.
and then just using my uh, ds equals to eq reversible over t that equals to cv over t et plus nr over v db. And then taking the integral on both ends, we got our expression of delta s equals to integral of cv over t et plus n r ln v final over v initial. And note that this is true for any reversible processes or reversible change of state for a perfect S. Right. So far, so good. Now, that's for the reversible change of state. What about irreversible change of state of a perfect gas? So in here, now we're thinking about a situation that on top of the reversible change of state, now let's imagine a process that we have, say, P1, V1, and T1 that undergoes irreversible change of state. Two, P2, V2, and T2. Right. That's the change of state. Now what we know is the reversible change of state, but what about irreversible processes? So in here, one of the um, strategy we use is in thermodynamics. Again, when we're talking about a state function or the delta S of this irreversible process, effectively, we only care about the entropy at state one and entropy of state two. Even if my state one and two are connected by irreversible processes, as long as we can build a reversible process linking my state one to state two, the delta S along that irreversible path and the delta S along that reversible path will be the same. All right, so the, to put it the other way, now imagine instead of this irreversible pathway, let's have, first of all, we'll keep our constant temperature and do a reversible um, change of volume at constant pressure or reversible isothermal expansion or contraction. Compression, sorry. Right, so the way to think about this, now we're keeping our temperature the same and changing my pressure and volume accordingly to the, um, the, vol the value we want. So we are changing P2, V2 while keeping, uh, well, we're changing the pressure and volume. We're changing the volume while keeping my temperature at constant. So now we have our V1 changed to V2 in a reversible isothermal process. The next step is let's see we have our uh, second step. Now we want to reversible change our heat. So it's like a very slow cooling or um, heating process of my gas, keeping the volume at constant.
Now, when we're talking about the delta S, now the delta S for my process A plus the delta S for my, for my process B must equal to my delta S of the entire process. All right, so the whole point here is thinking about reversible path that we can build so that we can solve for an irreversible process. So we'll see several examples after this. This is a general like leading philosophy. We went over this already, right? This is true. The delta S equals to delta S A plus delta S B because my entropy is a state function. It only matters what my initial and final state is. So now let's move on to several examples and see how do we use it. First example, let's say we have a more of a perfect gas that undergo an adiabatic free expansion into vacuum. So like a draw experiment. Now this is an adiabatic free expansion. What, how should we set up the calculation to get delta S? One of the common misunderstanding here is even if this process is adiabatic, the delta S is not zero because the free expansion into vacuum is not a reversible process. All right, so even if my, over, my overall process is adiabatic, it's um, the ds is not zero because here the dq is the dq irreversible. It's not the dq reversible. All right, so in this question, the common misunderstanding is it's adiabatic, yes, but the process is not reversible, so we cannot conclude ds is zero. So how do we do this? So for this question, we want to set up a reversible path so that the initial and final state are the same. Now in this question, what is our initial state? Now let's say our initial state is our uh, V1, and it is a free expansion. So we want to just use our, um, let, let's just use part B as an example. And final state is V2. So like what we just used, um, in order to set up a process for, to calculate delta S for this irreversible process, we want to dream up a potential reversible path linking my initial state and final state. So in here, what we want to do, again, like what we just said, the first step, let's imagine a isothermal expansion of the gas. It doesn't, it cannot be adiabatic, but let's imagine a reversible isothermal, um, adia, well, rever isothermal expansion of the gas so that our volume is going from volume one to volume two. And this expansion can go at a very slow rate. All right, so for this process, we're talking about expansion of gas into vacuum. So it is an expansion. So the temperature will drop in our first step. And in the second step, we know that our temperature will remain the same. So it's going to be a reversible heating of the gas after the expansion. All right, so the way to think about it is for the irreversible process, we have volume starting at V1 and expanding into V2 while keeping the temperature the same because it's adiabatic expansion. But now, instead of having that irre irreversible adiabatic expansion, now we write that into the first step is a reversible isothermal, uh, it's a reversible isothermal expansion of my gas into a larger volume. And then we bring everything back into our final state. 
Yes. How do you know the I think the first step cannot be isothermal. I might have got it wrong. So the first step is a reversible expansion of my um, gas from my volume one to volume two. Now in that first process, yes, you're right. And because we're expanding that ideal gas, the temperature must drop. So the second one is a reversible heat up, like a very slow heat up. So my temperature goes back to where I want. What an adiabatic expansion mean? Is this so here is the thing. First of all, adiabatic expansion is the irreversible setup. So let's do this again. So what we have in the initial state, we have V1, some temperature, and pressure is a little bit less of our concern in this case. Let's say V1 to temperature, and we have irreversible expansion, and we end up in V2 and the same temperature. All right, so for adiabatic expansion, so in this whole process, my temperature cannot change, so my delta U is not changing for my ideal gas. All right, so that's my initial state. That is my final state. And this expansion is an irreversible process. Now what we want to do is having a reversible expansion. So my V1 goes to V2, and my temperature drop into something called T prime. And the second step is going back to our um, final, to our fine, um, to our temperature that that's the initial temperature that's kept the same. So that's a reversible heat. So that my temperature go back to my original state. And then we can set up our, uh, since we can set up this pathway to link my initial and final state, um, it's more straightforward to just use our original um, equation that we just derived. So let's see. For our first step, we want to have our delta S go from my um, reversible expansion so that's my T1, T2, Cv over T, T, dt, plus nr ln V2 over V1. So this is not to T2, this is to T prime. And then my second one will be my Sb. Well, this is the reversible heating at constant uh, volume. So the second one will be from T prime to T2, CVT over T dT, and the second part is zero. So this term, because volume is the same, my um, log V2 over V2, this term is zero. So taking these two processes together, what we have is delta S, uh, let me make more space here. So my overall delta S well equals to delta S A plus delta S B. That gives us, well, if we take these two integral together, it's T1 to T prime and T prime to T2, that's the same as writing it as T1 to T2, CVT over T dT, and plus this volume change term, which is NR V2 over V1. With me so far? So, so instead of working on this irreversible process directly, we're building hypothetical two reversible processes that's leading to the same final state. So taking this together, what we end up having is this integral here. So this part is effectively talking about the change of our um, delta U and also our delta T between 
my T1 and T2, but my T1 and T2 are the same because after the two step, these two integral will add up to each other to T1 to T2 and my T1, T2 are the same. So this term ends up to be zero because my initial and final temperature is the same. What we need to calculate is this part, the volume change part. I'm gonna pause a little bit and see how, how do we think about this process. So this is one of the example in what exactly do we mean? Well, we say build a reversible path between your initial and final state. Yes? Just one more time go over why the integral cancels. So this one, um, we have two different integral. The first one is T1 to T prime. That's a hypothetical temperature that we don't know what it is. And then the second part is T prime to T2. But inside there, the CVT over T term is exactly the same. All right, so these two integral basically is telling you um, the, the two parts on that, on that curve, right? That's connected by a continuous function. So that's why these two end up to be like T1 to T2. Mm -hmm. But then it cancels in the top. Equation. Well, on the top, remember our T1 and T2 are the same temperature. Oh, it's an okay, adiabatic process, so the internal energy is not changing for my adiabatic free expansion. All right, so the overall internal energy must remain unchanged. Right, that's a Joule experiment setup. My internal energy delta U is zero. My temperature is not changing for this adiabatic free expansion of perfect gas. It doesn't matter which step to do first. You can reverse it and you get the same answer. Yes? So to conclude that there's no change in temperature, you got that work is zero, and Q is zero is the given, and then that means U is zero, which means there's no temperature change? Uh, let's see. Right, that's one of the logic you can use. That's the logic we use for the Joule experiment. The other logic to use, it's an adiabatic um, process. Um, so there's the internal energy must be conserved, right? Where the, the, the gas itself is not doing work on the surrounding and it's adiabatic. So the internal energy is conserved. You, we cannot create energy or destroy energy. Yes. So in this one, this goes back to our draw experiment. So at the, at the, um, I guess the, pro the, the way to put it is the temperature is not the, it's the same as your initial and final state. The temperature can change during the process. So for this example, we have adiabatic free expansion of your perfect gas into vacuum, right? So it's adiabatic. The system and surrounding are separated by an adiabatic wall, Q equals to zero. Now, the gas itself is not doing work on the surrounding W is zero. So the um, delta U or the change of internal energy must equal to zero. And since we're talking about an ideal gas, remember for ideal gases, the internal energy is only a function of temperature. So because delta U is zero, the change of temperature at initial and final state must be zero for Joule, Joule experiment. This is a special case, okay. all right? So it's not true when we say all adiabatic processes, temperature is constant. It's for the Joule experiment where it's adiabatic and work also equals to zero and it's ideal gas. Is the work zero because it's expanding? It's expanding into vacuum. So, like so that's why the work is zero. And let's do one more example to see what does it mean when we say build a hypothetical path. So in this example, we're talking about irreversible change of state of a perfect gas. And now let's think about a irreversible phase change. So the ex example question here is the following. Find delta S for the conversion of 10 gram of supercooled water at negative 10 degrees Celsius and one ATM into ice 
at negative 10 degrees Celsius. So this process is going to be irreversible, right? So water itself is super cold, liquid water at negative 10 degrees Celsius. It's below the, the, the melting point. So once that liquid water is being transferred into ice, it cannot be reversible if we directly have the phase change. With me so far? So this is why we cannot directly use delta H of freezing for this question. Alternatively, what we have is we can build a hypothetical reversible path. So in this question, what we have in the initial state, that's a liquid, and what we want is the uh, solid ice, both at negative 10 degrees Celsius. What kind of reversible path can we build in order to solve this problem? So imagine this is a multi-part comprehensive problem. The first question we'll ask you is give me a reversible path leading from your initial to final state. So how do we build it? Yes. Right, that's a very good point, right? So that's how we build it. The first one is we want to, what do we have? We have a way to calculate the reversible phase change and the entropy associated with the reversible phase change. So our first step is we want to bring the temperature up so that we can have reversible phase change. So our process A will be a reversible isobaric heat of my liquid water. Right, so my T initial is negative 10. Let's say my T prime or T intermediate is zero degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin liquid. And my um, pressure kept the same. And then we have our second step, which we can have our reversible phase change And we have a way to calculate our reversible phase change, which basically saying like, hey, we have constant T and P, and my um, Q reversible equals to QP, which is my delta H of phase change. And then after my second step, we got T remain the same, 273 Kelvin and it becomes solid, and my pressure remains the same. And at the end, we want to cool it down again, so my process C will be reversible, isobaric cooling of solid ice. So in here, what are the things we have? So for our first step, the reversible cooling, we have my delta S equals to one to two dQ reversible over T, and that gives us one to two CP over T dT. And in this case, remember the, the whole point we're changing my dQ reversible into CP dT, is saying at constant pressure, my Q, dQ equals to the change of enthalpy, and my dQ equals to CP dT in this question. The same applies to this one, the reversible iso, yes. So this one is when we have isobaric, what we have is dQ equals to dH. And my definition of my CP, um, well, so in this case, my average CP value is given. So we're just treating my CP as a constant. 
and then my dh becomes given cp is a constant for isothermal um, yeah, if we give you CV as a constant, then we can write du equals to CV dt directly at constant volume. And then for part C, that's the same. We're just taking the integral between, um, between 0 to negative 10 instead of negative 10 to 0. And for our part B, which is a reversible phase change, we have delta S equals to delta H. Well, this one is liquid to solid, so that's freezing over my temperature. And the overall delta S is my um, delta S for process A plus delta S for process B plus delta S for process C. Right. So once we have this relationship, you can just plug in the numbers and check our results. Yes. Um, you can only say that dQ for So um, dQ, dQ, okay. So dQp equals to dH. That's what we derive to say, hey, that's the physical meaning of enthalpy. That's what enthalpy is, generally true. Um, but this one, dH equals to Cp dt, this one is only true when we tell you either it is a perfect gas or we tell you like Cp is a constant. Okay, and one last question, which is again, an irreversible process and thinking about how can we build reversible pathways leading to that irreversible process. So this is a mixing of different inert perfect gas at um, constant PT. So uh, inert basically tells us these are perfect gases that not only they don't interact with each other, they also don't react with each other. So what we want is the irreversible mixing. We start from left hand, left hand side. We have um, left and right chamber containing two different types of gas molecules. The number of more of gas mole molecules are given by Na and Mb. Volumes of the chamber are given by Va and Vb. And let's say the pressure and temperature are kept constant in the process of mixing. So this is obviously an irreversible process, right? Once you mix the two types of gas, you cannot manually separate them. But how can we build a reversible path of the mixing of inert perfect gases so we can solve the delta S for the mixing of these inert perfect gases. So here's the thing. Thinking about building the, uh, ir the reversible path, the first step is thinking about what is the change of my thermodynamic state, right? So the first step is thinking about expanding both gases separately into our final volume, which equals to Va plus Vb. Or we can imagine a reversible isothermal expansion of both gases into my final volume, V, which equals to V1 plus V2. Right, so this one we already solved. We can simply write out my delta S equals to T1 to T2, Cv over T, dT plus Nr ln V final over V initial. So that's an equation we have solved. Since, so since we're, we're setting it to be an isothermal expansion, we have this term to be zero. Since it's isothermal, temperature is not changing. So my delta S thus equals to my Nr ln V final over V initial. Now, depending on which gas we're looking at, my delta S A well, equals to V A plus V B over V A. My delta S B equals to 
N R loin V A plus V B over V B, and my total delta S for this process A. Sorry, I should use small a and small b. So these small a and small b are referring to changes of my um gas type A, gas type B. And the larger A refer refers to the process of my first step, which is the sum of both gas expanding into the new volume, which is number of more of A times R line total volume over VA plus MB times R line VA plus VB over VB. Okay, so that's the first step. Expanding both my gas into the new volume, and let's call my VA plus VB as like total V. And then we can have isothermal mixing of expanded gas. So the result here is, um, is so the result here is quite straightforward, but it's a little bit of um, the mental gymnastic. So how does the the isothermal mixing takes place on a reversible pathway? So imagine on the left and right chamber now both expanded into my final volume V. On the left, we have a pressure for my uh, gas molecule A. On the right, we have a pressure for my gas volume B. So these PA and PB may be different since my NA and NB are different. So in here, imagine now we have two different semi-permeable membranes. So these are membranes that's only permeable to A or only permeable to B. And then by moving these membrane like really, really slowly, we can say that on left and right hand side of the membrane, the pressure are maintained at equilibrium. All right, so the way to think about it is this membrane is only permeable to A, to gas A, and this membrane is only permeable to gas B. So by moving these membranes like very, very slowly on the left and right hand side of my membrane A, my gas A is kept equilibrium. And by moving this membrane very slowly, my gas B is kept at equilibrium. And eventually we end up having our final chamber where my A and B are mixed together by a reversible pathway. So in this entire process, we're talking about an isothermal process. So my delta U equals to zero for my perfect gases. And while moving my um, semi, my while moving my semi permeable membranes, we only have like very infinitesimal changes of the force, and my pressure is always kept at equilibrium along these semi um, permeable membranes, so the overall work is also zero. And with this in hand, we can derive for this process, the Q reversible is zero while mixing, while like isothermally reversibly mixing my expanded gases. So this is a little bit of the mental gymnastic. And again, your textbook has a very uh, long illustrated paragraph describing how this process is taking place as well. And nevertheless, what we find out is the Q reversible equals to zero for this process B. And our total delta S or the change of entropy for mixing of my inert perfect gas thus becomes this equation, which is the one we just derived. We can further simplify what we just derived using our ideal gas law. 
So using PV equals to an RT, and also we know V equals to VA plus VB, and then using our um, more fraction, so chi A equals to number of more of A equals to an A, number of more of A plus number of more of B. So taking together, using my PV equals NRT, we got volume equals to VA plus VB equals to RT over P times NA plus NB. Or the other way to put it, we can simplify these terms, VA plus VB over VA as NA plus NB over NA, which equals to 1 over the more fraction. And the same applies to the uh, molecule B. Our conclusion is the delta S total equals to <coughs> NAR ln VA, V over VA plus NBR ln V over VB. Or replacing this V over VA term with a more fraction, we got that equals to NAR ln chi A minus NBR ln chi B. So that's for perfect gas, uh, mixing of perfect gas at constant temperature and pressure. I'm running out of time, but again, if you have any questions, feel free to check with us in like uh, review sessions and also in my office hour tomorrow. And also remember that one point uh, survey in like what topic you want me to cover more on our Wednesday's buffer lecture. All right, and good luck preparing. I'll see you on Wednesday.